I think I listen to the music to a movie more than I'm into the movie. I listen to the transitions. I listen to the emotion that the, the composer is trying to convey, you know, with, with the music. Welcome back to Last Words by the Pit. We have a very, very special show with thrash metal drumming legend Dave Lombardo and, of course, an incredible film and television composer, Phil Eisler. You guys both are part of this brand new film that was just released on Netflix called Thunder Force. And we have this incredible thrashy, heavy metal, headbanging soundtrack that goes along with the score. How did this all come together? Dave, how did this all come together? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, Phil and I have a, a mutual friend, composer uh, Tyler Bates, and I believe Phil had some ideas of putting, uh, you know, together some music uh, for the soundtrack. And... Um, and he he reached out you know he wanted to to bring in the the metal element and and uh i came to mind as well as scott ian and, you know and, and this is basically in a nutshell and i feel like phil could fill you in a little better than that you know <laughs> and uh he reached to a mutual friend that we have to get a hold of me and uh i was working on a project with scott and uh you know he asked me if i could reach uh, reach out to scott and and I said I would, and next thing you know, it all came together, and and uh, here we are. You know, I saw a, a scene in the movie where Melissa McCarthy's character's wearing a Slayer shirt, and she's literally telling people, like, you're going to rip this shirt off me over my dead body kind of thing. <laughs> and, so it was, a it was just a natural progression, obviously, natural lead it that way. Yeah. It was yeah. kismet. <laughs> Do you know what, though? I'd been thinking about doing this ever since. I mean... Look, I was a huge metalhead when I was a teenager, right? And and um, Slayer and Anthrax were two of my favorite bands. In fact, I would say Slayer and Anthrax were possibly the second and third gigs I ever saw when I was about 12, 13, something like that. And, um, and some years back when I got into film score and I remember thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could get this kind of super group together and then, you know, and then put orchestra on it and all the rest of it. And then the opportunity came along. So all I had to do then was go to Netflix and convince them that it was a great idea to give me a million dollars to hire two, two <laughs> guys, an orchestra and a choir, and it'll all be fine and it'll all work out great. And um, given, you know, the big ask, I think they were pretty good about it, actually. And yeah, I think at first they would be like, I'm sorry, thrash, what? Thrash metal? What, <laughs> what the hell is that? And then... Um, and then when they heard some demos and stuff, they were like, oh, okay, yeah, it works, it's good. You know, Dave, obviously you have no shortage of accomplishments in your life, um, especially on the musical side. I, I'm always curious about artists like yourself who, you know, obviously do a diverse kind of swath of projects. And then it seems like a natural progression to go into soundtracking. And I always think of Atticus Trent, just like people who have really raised the bar on how soundtracking can start to weave into like landscapes audibly, right? How, um, how's that transition been for you? And I saw that you a few years back did some stuff for Californication and a few other shows. Like how does one who is a legend in their own right get into that world? I mean, by, by showing f uh, fearlessness and, and not, and not uh, caring what anybody else says about what you do, you know, you just go out at it you know, uh, with your heart and what, what you want. Um, I'm, nothing's going to hold me back of something that I've always dreamed of doing um, or care of what anybody's opinion is or, or, or anything like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it started in 2004, again, with, with a mutual, our mutual friend, uh, Tyler Bates. He brought me in and, and had me record some drums for Dawn of the Dead. And, you know, ever since that, you know, that's just sparked an interest. And, you know, when you listen to soundtracks or, or I think I listen to the music to a movie more than I'm into the movie. I listen to the transitions. I listen to the emotion that the, the composer is trying to convey, you know, with the music. And, you know, so I don't know, that interest has always been there. And it's, it's just... 
I think it's just a natural, if, if you're a musician or like metalhead, just playing metal music all the time, but you like other styles of music and other ways of being creative, I think it's a natural progression to go there. You just, uh, uh, you just, you just go at it again, fearlessly. You, you don't, uh, you don't think about it. You just do it and you have fun doing it. You know, when, when Phil presented me with the music, you know, you, you have a point where you you have to really uh, dissect what he wants you to do. And um, it's, it's exciting, you know, it, you're challenged in every way. And so it's just, you know, uh, you're, I'm just continuing the love of music. And when, when movies and music go together so well, uh, that's probably just the natural step to go to. Almost the way I got into rock and metal was from hearing songs and film, be it Bohemian Rhapsody in Wayne's World or uh, Guns N' Roses in Terminator 2. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to ask everyone, kind of put this out to the whole uh, panel here. Is there any particular film soundtrack or a moment that was like inspirational to you or something that you still kind of sticks with you? Let's start mm -hmm. you, Phil. Yeah, Phil, I, I feel like you got some good ones, Phil. Man, I've got so many. D Terminator 2 was a good one, actually, because you, you know, you mentioned that growing up, it was all um, early James Cameron movies, um, Ridley Scott movies, Alien, Aliens, um, Blade Runner. D? Man, uh, wow. For me, it's like, you know, the, the, the songs that, like, for example, in, in The Omen, you know, the, the vocal, the choir, you know, song we, and, you know, all the mini moo, all this, <laughs> you know, that, you know, you know, scared me as a kid, you know, those voices, you know, just were ominous to me. And I think, you know, watching those movies, I think honed in what I liked and I enjoyed very dark and eerie sounds. And then I started becoming a, a fan of like, you know, uh, the classic, you know, the werewolf, Dracula. And you, you listen to, to those soundtracks and the eerie sounds that, that they developed and, and created at that time. And then, uh, you know, the film noir kind of episodes and, and like the Alfred Hitchcock's, you know, uh, stories. And I don't know, I just felt more, I like I gravitated more to the, the darker side and I really enjoyed that, you know. What about you, Zena? Any moments you can go back to and find some either? Because the thing is, I feel like right now we're like talking about soundtracks over here and scores over here, which are two different genres. It's We're talking about two, two different things. So, Zeno, you mean songs versus score, right? Well, well the thing is, I'm a fan of both. I mean, I'm going to get into it, but I want to hear from Zena first. Yeah, no, totally. You, It's a good call out because I was just thinking about that. I mean, I always think... You know, when I was younger, like listening to like compositions, like your Tim Burton, Danny Elfman kind of relationships, right? Yeah. Where it's like, you're creating landscapes was visually and sonically, right? That create an entire world that is moved literally through the score. Soundtracks, which is another thing that I love. Um, I feel I grew up in the nineties, right? <laughs> which I like to call the, do the, the golden <laughs> era of CD soundtracks. Um, oh. There were a lot of key ones, actually. I really loved, and this is not metal of me, but I thought it was an amazing soundtrack, but they also had a good score to this movie, was Romeo and Juliet with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh -huh. There were two songs on there to me that I feel were like two of the most mind-blowing songs that I heard when I was younger. Um, Garbage had a great song, Number One Crush on there, mm -hmm. and Radiohead had a really good song on there, uh, talk show host that was just like, when you put it against the backdrop of the movie, it was just an incredible way that it dropped. Like that entire soundtrack was fire. What about you, Doc? I'm sure Doc has some mind blowers. Yeah, right? like, well, mine, you know, my epic, I feel like the big four of the 90s is The Crow, Last Action Hero, Singles, and of, oh, course, yeah. and of course, Judgment Night. For me, you know, being of, of my age and my, my era of, of kind of introducing all this rock music, but then you have the scoring side of it. And obviously I'm wearing a They Live shirt. I mean, John Carpenter, just everything he's done is, uh, you know, maybe you know the most prominent figure in just from a musical standpoint in the synthwave genre of music is John Carpenter, which is kind of insane 
to to think about how you know how many classic uh, scores he did and, and just his tonality it was almost a um, a function of lack of budget and in independent filmmaking using synthesizers, but it became this aesthetic that really changed uh, and influenced so much to this day, things like Stranger Things. And I actually wanted to kind of ask a question just relating to how metal and, and heavy metal plays into this stuff. Is there a band or an artist or someone out there that you wish or do you think should be in a movie or should maybe get involved in scoring or have a song involved that isn't? Dave, <laughs> Patton do a lot of that already? Yeah, I feel like that's Patton's juice, right? How about Mr. Bungle or... Uh... <laughs> You know, the misfits or suicidal. I would I'd love to hear Dead Cross do a soundtrack, man. Yeah. <laughs> I had actually, funny enough, when I was living in LA, there was um there was a show that I think that you guys had played that never got played. It was uh we were it was so random. It was like at the not at the El Rey, I want to say it was a really random venue, but it like Mike hurt himself <laughs> and like <laughs> This show half started. Do you know what I'm talking about? The show half started and we're all sitting there waiting. I think we were with like Greg Pucciato and a few other people. We're all sitting there waiting and it never started. And the lights just went on. We're like, cool. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, yeah, Mike. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a sold out show in L.A. New band. And uh, Patton was uh, was leaving his house, jumped on a skateboard <laughs> And had his backpack and just cut his chin. He was, he was, it was like a, in a fight, you know? So, uh, yeah, we had to cancel and we postponed the show to the next day. Uh, you know, that, that was crazy. I remember going to his house and trying to stitch him up and not really stitch him up, trying to put the wound back together. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. I got pictures of it. No, oh, it's horrible. But, okay, I feel I feel like at least I wasn't lied to after we had sat there for two hours waiting. <laughs> yeah, it was horrible. It was terrible to try to explain to the crowd what happened, and uh, and then you know having to postpone the show till the following day. Luckily, the venue was was available, and we were able to play the gig. You know, and the, the first thing the guy does after you know having stitches, I don't know, eight stitches on his chin, nine stitches on his chin. You know, the first thing he does is the music starts and before he even starts singing, he jumps into the crowd. It's like, okay, great. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, crazy life. man. Well, what about Phantom Boss did the director's cut record though, with doing, I guess, covers of scores, right? Yes. Yeah. Patton, man, put that together beautifully. Um, I got to get you one of those CDs, Phil. Oh, yeah, man, I love it. Uh, oh, man. Uh, he took songs like Rosemary's Baby, The Omen, Spider Baby, uh, The Golem, Investigation uh, of a Citizen. Uh, I, I forget. Uh, and then there's another Twin Peaks song. Um, oh, I got to check that out. I mean, Patton's a genius, man. Yeah. But he put the, this album together and it's it's ma it's a masterpiece. And uh, with metal elements uh, and um, times I had to play with brushes, you know, and hit oh, bells and, and all this stuff. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun, man. It, being part of any kind of movie score or, you know, transposing, you know, metal into movie scores or movie themes is always fun. And, and it's, it's a, uh, it's an area that should be, you know, explored a little more. What about you, Phil? Is there, is there any more thrash metal artists you want to put in films that we, we don't know about yet? I mean, listen, if I was going to put together another, you know, super group like I was fortunate enough to just do, it would basically be these two. Man, it would be great to get Hetfield. He's, <laughs> he's, you know, he's incredible. That guy, I still feel like that that guy is one of the best guitar players in thrash metal to this day. Never mind that you know he's another inventor of the the whole genre. But find no argument here. <laughs> you know, Zena, do you have any wish list for artists you'd like to see in a in a film? More Mike Patton. I'm a Patton stan to be honest. 
<laughs> I really, I'm just so impressed by his like depth of talent. And I think, um, you know, as David mentioned, like he's just done so many incredible things and from opera <laughs> to obviously what Dead Cross is doing, like he's just so versatile. I feel like Patton can really take on any of those challenges and make it cool, right? Like he always has a way to just make it super cool. What about you, Doc? Uh, I think it's the most obvious thing in the world. And I don't, I don't, I feel like some film executive out there or some director, some producer really has to answer for this is that you had three Godzilla movies come out in about a five or six year span and they didn't call the band Gojira. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Last Words. Mr. Dave Lombardo, where can the people find you online? You can find me on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook. At what, though? Uh, I don't know. I just go to <laughs> at Dave Lombardo. <laughs> you know where to find Dave. Google it. He's easy to find. <laughs> He's a legend. Just Google him. You'll find him. Just, just find me, man. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Eisler, where can the people find you online? Same thing. You can, you can find me on uh, Instagram most days, most on a good day. Uh, at Phil Eisler Music. Thank you both so much for joining us on the show. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Doc Coyle. Zena, where can the people find you? Uh, you can Google me too, two E's, uh, but at Zena Coda everywhere you can uh, find me. If you want to follow us, check us out at We Are The Pits on all platforms. If you like what you saw, you can check out the entire unedited podcast. The Pit presents Last Words anywhere where you find podcasts. We post it every Thursday. Thursday.